What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. As I look out and I see the truth of God's word in the form of a family, as we just sung and we'll sing again, love will hold us together. I want to begin today by asking you a question, as I often do. I want to ask you, what are you looking for? Today, wherever you are, I recognize it's Sunday morning where I am. It may be Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening where some of you are, and it may be months from now later if you're watching and taking in this time of worship through media. Wherever you are, what are you looking for? Right now, what are you looking for? I dare say, I pray that you, that all of us, would in part be looking for, longing for harmony. And if you don't think that you are, I want you to know you're wrong. Because all of us are looking for harmony. The difference is how we find it or define it. Some are looking in all the wrong places. I want to encourage you to think, if you will, about God's word. Where are some places in the Bible that your pursuit of harmony might take you? And I recognize some of you will say, I, I don't go to the Bible. I don't know the Bible. I pray some of that will change. Let me tell you a couple of the places that I go to on a regular basis. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which tells me that all of the Bible is God-breathed and it's been given supernaturally for the purpose of teaching, correcting, rebuking, and equipping for all of the works of righteousness that God has for us. I find that to be an incredible gift of assurance. I also like John chapter 17. Some of you will recognize that as Christ's high priestly prayer. I don't put it in that kind of description. I just see Jesus praying for us, his family. And I find that to be the most intimate place in all the Bible. And so I take it to heart. And I want you to know that it's in that place where Jesus is praying that we will be the family of God. I pray today that you'll see that if you are willing to acknowledge that you are seeking harmony, the only place you'll find it is in the family of God. And more than that, more than that, because you'll find quiet. You can, you can go out in a desert and find quiet. That's not harmony. You can get along with everybody and seemingly have a good fit. It's not harmony. I've had that in the army. We're a bunch of pagans doing all kinds of stuff. But we're getting along great. Had harmony. It's not biblical harmony. So I want to encourage you to pray with me today that God will help you and me, all of us, to understand how to find harmony. That's the title of today's sermon, Finding Harmony. Some of you know in the last three weeks we've looked at finally harmony and we saw God's word pointing to where you'll find it, how to define it. Last week, we looked at family harmony, and we recognized that if you want harmony under the roof of your house, you need to get right and have family harmony with the creator of not only your house, but all things. Today, we're going to look at finding harmony, and I'll show you seven points from God's word that are going to literally just cascade down out of the scriptures. I hope to baptize you today to immerse, submerge, bring you under the cleansing word of God and therein help you to find harmony and perhaps more importantly, help you to grow as a helper of others to find harmony. So I wanna ask you to pray with me as we begin and we get ready to go into 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Lord, I do pray on behalf of each one within the sound of my voice. I ask you, Lord, starting with me, to do a transformative work. For some, we'll call it justification, as you adopt them into the family of God. For others, it'll be sanctification, as you continue to refine us miraculously 
into greater forms and fashions of Christ-likeness. May it be so for everyone within the sound of my voice, all by your grace, all through the truth and love of your gospel, and all and always for your glory. No more, no less, no matter what. Amen and amen. Well, friends, I want to remind you, if you've not been with us, we're walking through 1 Peter, verse by verse. We're now in week number 35, and we've been averaging about two verses a week. And if you've been with us, you know the question is not why so slow, but why so fast? There is so much here. And I must tell you, my intention today up until Friday was to cover chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. And Friday afternoon, the Lord jerked me up and said, slow down. Verse 8 and verse 8 alone. And I pray that once again, you'll see that there is so much here. Oh, a weak sermon doesn't seem to do it near justice. For those that haven't been with us, 1 Peter is a letter being written to the persecuted church many of which are contemplating a departure. They're giving in perhaps to cowardice instead of following in Christ's likeness. And we've seen that the letter is split into two large parts. The first 35 verses cover what it is to be the blessed and beloved people of God. It defines us. And then from there throughout the rest, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 to the end of the book, it's all about biblical behavior for those blessed beloved. And that second half or second part, it has three subsets. We're getting ready to close the first part, which is the harmonizing family of God. You'll see shortly we're about to move into the hurting family of God. And the book will end with the helping parts of the family of God. So as we continue here and we begin now to look at 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 8, let me remind you, finally harmony, it's defining the church. Family harmony was seeing that in order to have it in your house, you need to have him in your heart. And today, finding harmony, you're going to see how God is harmonizing and inviting you and me to walk with him in this harmonized journey of the gospel by his grace and for his glory. Now, let me show you a map of the world. This was something we've already looked at, and it's our bridge family in part. And here we see God is harmonizing our bridge family locally, regionally, globally. I'm blessed today to have our brother Moses with us from Uganda here in Maryland. It's a part of what we've seen God promise and do. He said, you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be, you, church, you'll be my harmonized witnesses locally, regionally, and globally. Then we moved last week and I showed you this portrait of a family being harmonized through the miraculous and the missional marriage triangle. And we zeroed in to what it means to be that nuclear family of sorts, in and with and for Christ. And one of the things we didn't cover was a fuller picture. Let me just give you a quick summary. That when the Bible's talking about husbands and wives, we noted that you need to understand that's first being married to Christ, being the bride of Christ, him the bridegroom, Only from that place could you properly contextualize biblical teaching on what it is to be a husband and wife. We noted that it's intentional, him and her, not him and him, not her and her, not an alphabet soup with an alphabet soup. This is God's design. He's the one. If you hope to have any harmony, you're going to be in line with him, his definitions, his descriptions, his promises, his power. What we didn't dig into last week, and let me just say quickly here, it's to recognize the purpose of human marriage is to display holy harmony to the world. That our fleshly marriages are designed to show the world the faithful marriage of the great bridegroom to his bride. Our marriages have purposes. 
If you hope to have harmony, you need to understand that and be that. Break that and you will not know harmony. You may know a counterfeit, you may know some kind of a placebo effect, but you will not know the real deal. Let me just point out that if you go to the Bible, literally opening up first two chapters, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, you see marriage created. Go one more chapter, chapter 3, you see marriage broken. You find dysfunctional families starting in and throughout the Bible. You want to fix that? Get in line with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Again, if you hope to find harmony in any sense, you're gonna find it in King, Creator, Christ. His word, his will, his ways. I pray that's our passion, is to harmonize as a people, first individually and then collectively, in the word, will, and ways of the grace, gospel, and glory of our God. You'll find, those of you that are familiar with the tougher sides of life, Uh, Most of us have had some time in the swamp. We've known what it is to be in real life. You'll find that the funk in dysfunctional families is sin. The funk of dysfunctional is always sin. And have you ever noticed, no matter where you're at, I is always at the center of sin. I is always at the center of sin. Spell it out. You'll see it. I, I, I. In fact, if you spell out dysfunctional family, you'll find three I's there. I, I, I. It's selfishness. It's not loving. I like to say that selfish kills us. Selfish kills us. Think about it again in context of our worldly relationships. Divorce. Divorce is division. God wants us to be unified together. He wants us to harmonize vertically and horizontally. And every time you find biblical division, you'll find the devil. The devil is in the division. The devil is in the division every time to some extent. It's breaking God's word, God's will, and God's ways. It's a form of idolatry, really. I want more than. Idolatry becomes a form of adultery. Spiritually speaking, I want brings you to a place of adultery against God's will. And you could say it the other way. Adultery is another form of idolatry because you're breaking ranks with what God wants, whether it's spiritual or physical. Please understand how important this is. If you want to go deeper, Ephesians chapter 5 will speak to you as husbands and wives, but I promise you it's the same message. It's get right in the marriage that is vertical and he will empower your righteousness in your marriages that are horizontal. Break ranks vertically, you're a ticking time bomb horizontally. It's just a matter of time. Even for the person who says, no, my, my grandparents, they went to their graves that way. And I said, yeah, and then boom. Nobody avoids judgment day. So even if you think that it's working out okay and you've got a path, it's the broad way and it'll lead to destruction if it's not in harmony with the word, the will, and the ways of the word that is God and the word of God. Let me show it to you in a way that I think really is beautiful. We hang this quilt in our sanctuary. It's a portrait of 1 Corinthians 12, 12, where we see that God's word says that all the members of the body, though many are one, are one body. So it is with Christ. This is what it is to be in harmony as the family of God. I think of it as the fruit of the Spirit. We see in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, a single fruit, one fruit, singular, very important you get this, with nine facets. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. 
One fruit, nine facets, harmonized. Think about it, friends. When you have been harmonizing in and as the fruit of the Spirit, you've known a peace that passes all understanding. That's the way God spoke it to the Philippians through Paul. You know what it is to have harmony when you are right and righteous vertically. This is the key. And watch before we're done. Our Lord, through his word, as the word says, and that needs to be harmonized as that quilt represents. That we need to be the family in harmony. It's the big idea for today. When he and we overtake me, there will be harmony. When he, God Almighty, and we, the family of God, overtake the I, 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 me, 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 then there will be holy harmony. Conversely, you show me the prima donna, you show me the me, 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 the I, 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 and I'll show you a harmony wrecker. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. We have one king. He's given us the blueprint for living, to build to code. I pray that you'll see this. Let me give you a seven-step preview of where we're going. We're gonna unpack one verse. So if you have your Bible, and I pray that you do, come with me to 1 Peter chapter three. We're gonna look at verse eight, just verse eight. This will be the fourth week we've tapped into this verse. We're gonna cover the whole thing today. What you're gonna see is if you want to find harmony, and I pray you do, you start with God's finish line. Start with God's finish line. Second, you submit all of you. Submit all of you. Third, you think like Christ. Fourth, you sympathize like Christ. Fifth, you love like Christ. Sixth, you care like Christ. And seven, you submit, you witness like Christ. Watch, not my words, literally gonna fall right out of the pages of the Bible. And I pray bless you if you're looking for harmony vertically and horizontally. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. Let me show you the scripture. We'll read it together. First Peter chapter three, verse eight. Finally, finally, all, all of you be harmonious or have unity of mind. Have sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Finally, we're gonna begin at the finish line. You wanna find harmony? Start at the finale. Finally, this word, let me show it to you. It's the last and lasting summary on what has been the portrait of how the family of God is to live. It's an inclusive contextualization. Finally, it's saying all of what we've covered thus far comes to a crescendo right here. And note, it's got a stressing tone of urgency. Finally, finally. Don't miss that. Because every time in the Bible you read the word finally, at some level, it's connecting to the gospel and the reality of heaven and hell. Finally, to fully embrace biblical finality has to connect to the gospel and the reality of heaven and hell. If we want to have biblical harmony, you gotta deal with the reality of the gospel and the reality of heaven and hell. Finally, I want you to see if you've not come to grips with sin and the Savior, you're not ready for finally. Finally begins with an understanding of our sin and our Savior. 
Start at the finish line. Watch this, and I pray, have your heart tenderized to a better understanding of what sin is. Most people assume the Bible has a lot to say about how messed up humans are, and that's true. It's also true that the Bible's vocabulary about this topic sounds odd to modern people, using words like sin, iniquity, or transgression. And so the Bible's perspective on the human condition is often ignored or treated as ancient and backwards. This is really unfortunate, because through these words, the biblical authors are offering us a deeply profound diagnosis of human nature. Iniquity describes behavior that's crooked, while transgression refers to breaking trust. And sin? This is actually the most common of these bad words in the Bible. So let's focus on it for a few minutes. Sin translates the Hebrew word chata and the Greek word hamartia. The most basic meaning of sin isn't religious at all. Chata simply means to fail or miss the goal. Like when the Israelite tribe of Benjamin trained a small army of slingshot experts, they could sling a stone at a hare and not chata, that is, fail or miss. Or there's a biblical proverb that warns against making hasty decisions because you're likely to chata your way, miss your destination. So in the Bible, sin is a failure to fulfill a goal. But what's the goal? Well, on page one of the Bible, we learn that every human is an image of God, a sacred being who represents the Creator and is worthy of respect. And so in this way of seeing the world, sin is a failure to love God and others by not treating them with the honor they deserve. You can see this idea in the famous code of conduct given to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. Half of them identify ways you can fail at loving God, and the other half name ways you can fail at loving people. And the fact that both kinds of failure are combined shows that failing to honor God is deeply connected to failing to honor people. This is why in the Bible, sin against people is sin against God. Like when Joseph refuses to sleep with the wife of Potiphar, he says, how could I sin against God? In Joseph's mind, failing to honor a human made in God's image is a failure to love God. And so, sin is a failure to be truly human. But there's more. A fascinating thing about sin in the Bible is that most of the time that people are failing, they either don't know it, or even worse, they think they're succeeding. Like when Pharaoh wants to build Egypt's economy and protect national security, in his mind, this justifies enslaving the Israelites. He thinks it's good, and he's totally unaware that it's an epic fail. Or when King Saul is chasing David around the wilderness trying to kill him, he thought he was bringing a criminal to justice until he realizes he's the corrupt one. And he says, I have sinned, I am the failure. So sin is about more than just doing bad things. It describes how we easily deceive ourselves and spin illusions to redefine our bad decisions as good ones. So why are humans such bad judges between moral failure and success? Well, the first appearance of the word sin in the Bible offers an insight. There are these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Their parents had just given in to this beastly temptation to redefine good and evil by their own wisdom, and now Cain is faced with a similar choice. He's jealous and angry that God has favored his brother, and so God warns him, if you don't choose what is good, chata is crouching at the door, it wants you but you can rule over it. So in these stories, sin or moral failure is depicted as this wild, hungry animal that wants to consume humans. And we know how that story ends. The Bible is trying to tell us that failed human behavior, our tendency towards self-deception, it runs deep. It's rooted in our desires and selfish urges that compel us to act for our own benefit at the expense of others. And it leads to this chain reaction of relational breakdown. This is why in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul describes hamartia as a power or a force that rules humans. In his words, we are slaves to sin. He even says sin lives in us so that the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. So with the word sin, the biblical authors are offering a robust description of the human condition. It's a failure to be humans who fully love God and others. It's our inability to judge whether we're succeeding or failing. And it's that deep, selfish impulse that drives much of our behavior. This is not a pretty picture of ourselves, but if we're honest, it's realistic. This is why in the Bible, the story of Jesus is such good news. He's depicted as the creator become a truly human one who did not fail to love God and others. That is, he did not sin.
And yet, he took responsibility for humanity's history of failure. He lived for others, and he died for their sins. And he was raised from the dead to offer them the gift of his life that covers for their failures. Or in the words of the apostles, he committed no sin, yet he carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live to do what is right. And that's the story behind the biblical word for sin. So amen. We got to finally, and finally is connected to sin and Savior. All biblical finality comes back to the gospel and its reality of the consequence of heaven and or hell. You can't, I can't, we can't get to a place of finding harmony until we've dealt with sin, until we've come to this understanding. Let me show it to you the way that we do here at the bridge. We have the stick man gospel. Notice again, Christ and the cross at the center. Only those that come to and through Christ, creator, king, can be cleansed of the sin problem and open the door to the pursuit of finding harmony. Those that jump over, the religious that are in church but not in Christ, those that tunnel under the wolves in sheep's clothing or the false teachers that are literally sharks and snakes and not shepherds, no harmony for them. They're the harmony wreckers, whether it's inadvertently or by design. You and I need to understand that if we hope to find harmony, we need to first be in the family of God. And you cannot get there without first dealing with, having dealt with your sin, my sin. Without the Savior, you and I still have an eternal sin problem and there will be no harmony for those that are heading to hell. It's needing to have sin cleansed. And this is what we see in the next part of the verse. Let me show it to you. Finally, all of you, all of you. This is explicitly 100% all-inclusive. It's referring to true Christians. It is without exception. You've got to understand this. In order for you to find harmony, you have to be at home with a holy God. Not perfectly, but you have to have been cleansed by the cross of Christ. There is no harmony to be found without Christ. All of you means not 99% of you, all of you. It's a quality and a quantity matter. All of the Christians. The Christians are those for whom all their sin has been forgiven. It's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand that as you'll see, this is for the church. This defines us, church. You cannot find harmony if you're not in the holy, harmonized family of God. Please hear this. There is no hope there is no healing. There is no harmony without Christ and his gospel. And for those for whom this truth of holy harmony is your identity, you are the church. We are the family of God. And his family is meant to live in harmony. Again, let me show it to you in a two-minute part and then I want to give you a living illustration. Watch this. A lot of times I'm speaking to people and we're talking through um, who we are as God's people. And they'll ask the question, well, what's the church? And they often ask what instead of who, which I think is really interesting because I think the definition of the church should be defined by the biblical definition, which is it's a people. Uh, when, when Peter gives definition of the church, he says you're the, you're, the, you're the people of God. You're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And so I've tried to make it simple and say we are the regenerate people of God, saved by the power of God for the purposes of God in this world. Uh, now, that can be expanded in a lot of ways, but I think one of the misunderstandings often about church is that we take the word 
word church, which is ecclesia, which means gathered or gathering. And we say, well, the church has got to then therefore be a gathering. And we equate an event to the church. But the scriptures talk about ecclesia as the gathered ones, the ones gathered to Jesus Christ. So the ones who built their whole life around him as king and Lord, him as savior, and he as the one who builds his church. And so... Um, in a sense, the church is not an event in that sense. It, it's centered on the event of Christ saving a people to himself, and therefore there are gathered people to Jesus in all of life. And so it radically changes, I think, our perspective if we buy into that, because what it means now is Jesus is building his church every single moment of every day through his people in the world, and therefore all that we do counts, because it's not just a couple hours that we are church. It's all of life where we live as his church, as his people in the world, bringing glory to God in all things. And that's actually how we came up with the name for, for our church. Uh, Paul in Ephesians 1 said, Christ is the head of his church, which is his body. That's the Greek word soma, in which he fills all in all. And Paul's picture that he's trying to paint to the church at that point is Christ wants to saturate the entire world with his presence through his people as he is head, building out his church in every place. So that changes a lot in terms of how you then see yourself, because if you are regenerate by the power of God, which is the work of God in salvation through Jesus Christ, then you are now the church. You don't go to it. You are it. Amen and amen and amen. Finally, all of you. This is God's word speaking to the family of God. And I shared with you that there would be a teaching, as you just heard, that helps us to understand that this is not a part-time thing. This is not a Sunday morning thing. This is not when I put on my elder hat. This is all day, every day being. It has nothing to do with how much you do. It's who you are or are not. This is so, so important. If you want to find harmony, the only way that you'll ever find harmony is in the family of Jesus the Christ. Not in a church building, not in a denomination, not in some religious set of standards. It's in Christ. It's being his child as a part of his family. Finally, you've dealt with sin You've been saved by grace. Now it's time, all of you, to embrace sanctification. Here we go, from here to heaven. And we have a living, breathing example of this celebration and declaration today. Josh has come for the purpose of letting the world know that he is now a child of God. He is a child of the King. He has been changed by grace through faith, not of any work so that he or no one else will boast. But he's been saved for good works that God had planned for him before time began. We have an example of what it is to celebrate being finally a part of the all of you. Josh, I want to ask you, why are we here? Your own words, why are we here? Uh. I'd like to keep it, I'd like to say a few things, and uh, I'll keep it brief. Um, <clears throat> as you all know, we're, we're, we're going through First Peter, uh, Pastor Jeff's favorite book in the Bible, and uh, we've been talking about husbands and wives, and um, <clears throat> my wife and I will be married five years at the end of the month, and um, uh, for a long time, um, we had many debates. She was raised uh, in a Catholic home, uh, so you, you could imagine that we have our own differences. And one of the big differences was that she knew Christ and I did not. And um, she was very patient with me, as, as it, 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 like we've been discussing, and, um, and now she's here to support me today. So I'm very blessed to have her as my wife and uh, our two beautiful children. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, for a long time, I leaned on my own understanding of, of the faith, and I was wrong for that. And it wasn't until I was invited here uh, to, to this place, to the bridge, uh, that you all embraced me and uh, welcomed me with open arms. And uh, I experienced kindness from strangers that I had never experienced before. 
And, uh, you know, um, b between your example and um, the sermons that, that Pastor Jeff gives, I learned what it meant to be the church. And I'm here today to express that um, and to show that uh, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That was the declaration of the early church. No matter where you were, it was summarized in those three words. Jesus is Lord. Amen. So it's my blessing, Josh, to just clarify, you're here because you're a Christian. You know that this doesn't make you a Christian. Yes. You're here because God has come to rescue you, saved your soul. You're confident you're an adopted child of the King. Confident. Amen. 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 Josh told me he thought he was when he came. He realized he wasn't when he was here. And by God's grace, he knows that he is today. That's the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, I'm also blessed to say, not only is there a human example in Josh's baptism, but there's a human example of what it is to be that harmonized family of God, locally, regionally, and globally. I've asked Moses if he would come and help me representing our family on the continent of Africa, in the country of Uganda, with the support of Kenya and the Congo, to come alongside. And I pray that you'll always remember this, Josh, that you were baptized by the one who's privileged to be your pastor and by one of your brothers from the other side of the world who's every bit as big a part of your life because we are harmonized in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So upon your public profession to all the world that Jesus is Lord, and he's not just the Lord, he's your Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Then Moses and I together in the context of your family we have this great honor and privilege, Josh, to now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to welcome you into this harmonized home and family. We're a small part of a very big family. So now, with that said, Josh, Moses and I, we're gonna take you back and symbolizing going with Christ into the cave, going under the water of baptism, and then coming raised up in the newness of life as Christ came out of the tomb alive, you, brother, are going to be another note in this beautifully harmonized song of the church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Josh, we now baptize you, our brother. Amen and amen. Wow. Amen. Now watch as God and his family continue. Josh is no doubt freezing right now. <laughs> and the love and the warmth and the fullness of the gospel continues. Literally, we have a human exclamation mark on the truth and love of God's word. Oh, what a blessed family we are. Amen? Amen. Amen. And notice again, it's family. Let me show you something that we've seen. It's the Stickman Church. Because what Josh has just been invited into is this, the holy harmony family of God, which is imperfect but passionate. I shared this with you when we went through what it was to be the church and said the real church is filled with the sheep, the sheep dogs, and the shepherds, but we're upside down. We're still cracked pots, right? We saw this last week, that the Lord put his treasure, go ahead, Doug will take you. Uh, the Lord puts his treasure of Christ and his gospel in we, the cracked pots that are his family. But what Josh has just come into, what Peter is calling people to is to be in this family of God. Let me again show it to you. We're gonna walk through this verse and see here the opening of finally all of you. Finally all of you have unity of mind. Be in harmony. Here what we have is a call to be unified in the mind of Christ. Listen to Romans 12. Literally, verse 16, live in harmony with one another, period. There's no wiggle room. 
This is a command from Christ. Be the church, live in harmony with one another. Go down to verse verse five of chapter 15, still in Romans. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you, give you, to live in such harmony with one another that it is in accord with Christ Jesus. Don't miss this, Romans 15, five. May you be gifted the grace that allows you to live in harmony with one another, which is now in accord with Christ Jesus. Say, Pastor Jeff, why are you stressing that? Because if you're not in accord with the family of God, you're not in accord with Christ. Hear me, for all of you independent thinkers, For everybody thinks that it's okay to be off on your own. I don't have to be a part of that quilt. I don't have to harmonize. Again, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another that you are in accord with Christ Jesus. And you heard it up above in chapter 12. Live in harmony with one another. You want to find harmony? Get in harmony with Christ and his family. You cannot, you cannot have the fullness of biblical holy harmony outside of a right and righteous relationship with his family. And I know how this works. Well, I'll just go find another one of his families and we'll get along over there. That's broken harmony. That's broken koinonia. That's a horrible witness. You're telling the world that so long as you're in charge, you'll find somebody that will embrace you as you want to be. That is not holy harmony. That is a broken witness of the church of Jesus Christ. That goes against John 17. That goes against 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You cannot overemphasize the importance of koinonia and being the church in holy harmony with one another. The degree to which that's not in place is a stain on the name and the witness of Christ. It's that big a deal. It comes down to personal submission. That's how this whole letter began. Those of us who are submitted to the creator who caused us to be born again. At the end of the definition of the beloved and the blessed, those who are submitted to him will then live submitted to one another. This is the crescendo. You want this harmony? You live submitted. You step away from your perch. You gotta deal with transgression. Let me show you a better understanding of that. Most people assume the Bible has a lot to say about how messed up humans are, and that's true. It's also true that the Bible's vocabulary about this topic sounds odd to modern people, using words like sin, iniquity, or transgression. And so the Bible's perspective on the human condition is often ignored or treated as ancient and backwards. This is really unfortunate, because through these words, the biblical authors are offering us a deeply profound diagnosis of human nature. Iniquity refers to behavior that's crooked, while sin refers to moral failure. And transgression, this is a fascinating word that you for sure haven't used in conversation recently. So let's focus on it for a few minutes. In Old Testament Hebrew, the noun is pesha, and the verb is pasha. In the New Testament, the Greek word is paraptoma. They're usually translated as transgression, sometimes as rebellion, and in older translations as trespass. These words refer to ways that people violate the trust of others. Pesha describes the betrayal of a relationship, and since there are many kinds of relationships, a lot of different behaviors can be called Pesha. Like if two nations are in a relationship, we would call that a treaty, and Pesha would describe the breaking of that agreement. Like in the biblical book of 2 Kings, we read, after the death of King Ahab, Moab pashad with Israel. Now, this is usually translated, Moab rebelled against Israel. But in biblical Hebrew, you don't pasha against someone, you pasha with them. That is, you break trust with that person. The same idea appears in an Old Testament law about theft. If an Israelite is away on a trip and somebody sneaks into their house and steals something, that's robbery. But if the thief was your neighbor, it's Pesha, 
because there's someone you should be able to trust. Or there's a story about Jacob running away from Laban, his uncle. Laban accuses Jacob of stealing some idol statues. He searches all of Jacob's belongings and he finds nothing. So Jacob shouts, what is my Pesha? How have I violated your trust? But the sad irony is that the statues were stolen by Jacob's wife, who is Laban's own daughter. Talk about breaking trust. So Pesha involves one person or group violating a relationship of trust with another. And this is a really common word in the Bible because it's one long story about a broken relationship between God and the Israelites. At Mount Sinai, they agreed to worship only their God and to care for the poor among them, but they didn't. And so God raised up prophets to confront them, like Micah, who said, I'm full of power with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and courage, so I can declare to Jacob his Pesha. Or the prophet Amos, he accused the Israelites of Pesha, specifically for idolatry and selling the poor for a pair of sandals. He also accused other nations like Tyre, who profited from capturing whole towns and then selling them into slavery. Or the Ammonites for murdering the innocent to enlarge their borders. For Amos, these are all acts of Pesha. They violate the universal trust that exists between all humans who are made in the image of God. He watched these leaders ignore or justify the mistreatment of humans in the name of national security or a strong economy. But for Amos, it was a betrayal of humanity. And it makes perfect sense why these prophets associate Pesha with words like treachery or falsehood. In the Greek New Testament, the Apostle Paul develops this portrait of humans as trust breakers, using the word paraptoma. He recalls the story in Genesis about Adam, that means humanity in Hebrew. And in that story, humanity breaks trust with God and seizes authority to discern good and evil on their own terms. Paul calls this the paraptoma of Adam, humanity's violation of trust with God and with each other. And it leads to a complicated web of betrayed and broken relationships leading towards violence and death. But for Paul, that is not the last word. He says, if death came to all by the paraptoma of a human, how much more will God's gracious gift overflow to many by means of a human, Jesus the Messiah? Instead of letting humanity destroy itself in treachery, God raised up a human who would allow our Pasha to do its worst to him. Here Paul is drawing on the prophet Isaiah's portrait of the suffering servant, the one who would commit no violence or have any treachery on his lips, yet he would be counted among those in Pasha, bearing their failures and interceding on their behalf. And this is the surprising story of the Bible, that God's response to humanity's Pasha and Paraptoma was to be trustworthy on our behalf. The apostles claim that in Jesus, God took responsibility for our betrayal so that he could open up a new future and a new way to be human, the way of faithfulness, trustworthiness, and integrity. That's the kind of human that Jesus was and is, and it's the kind of humans he wants to create as he faithfully guides our world into the new creation. And that's the fascinating story behind our biblical words for transgression. So I pray that you see, finally, all of you have unity of mind. If you and I don't have the mind of Christ, we're not going to have harmony. If we're not putting his priorities as our shared priorities, if his definitions are not our shared definitions, if his mission is not our shared mission, if we are out of sync with him, we'll be out of sync with one another, and there will not be harmony. So to find this harmony, if we are going to live in harmony, we have to think in harmony. If we're not thinking in harmony, we're not likely going to live in harmony. Please see here, getting righteous in your relationship to transgression. Have you ever been in harmony with somebody you couldn't trust? Let me help. No. You've been nice. Maybe you've coexisted. We see the bumper sticker. But you can't be in harmony where transgression has not been addressed. And again, I bring you to the cross of Christ. Transgression for the family of God has been dealt with on the cross. It calls for you and me to be humbly harmonizing in the gospel. Gospel your relationships. Gospel your relationships. You want to find harmony? Gospel your relationships.
It doesn't mean swallow everything and sweep it under the rug. It means truth and love, truth and love, truth and love, no matter what. This is the way of God. Listen to Ephesians 4 opening up. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you have been called, again, called, called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another. You're gonna hear one a bunch of times. Bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain, not willing to, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, again, to the one hope that belongs to your call, again. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all. Note, four alls. Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. You want to find harmony? It's in Christ and in his church family. If you're out of sync with either one, you're not going to have this holy harmony. Albert Barnes says of this passage and understanding, he says it's not just pointing to harmony, it's to help the Christian to understand your primary goal here is to help secure harmony. One translation says to zealously defend the unity of the body. I pray that you and I see this. Let me show you how the verse continues, but I'm gonna leapfrog I'm going from the first point to the fifth point. Some of you already figured out where I'm going. But if you're going to have unity of mind, it's going to require a unity and a humility of mind. That you and I need to have this sense of self that's not puffed up. Okay? You're never going to have unity and harmony with a porcupine or a self-inflated me, me, me person. And you ought not until they come to that place of humble, loving Christ-likeness. And for those who don't like the idea of being called to a holy humility, let me just point out to you that our times today are very much like the times of Peter. The Greco-Roman world hated humility. You were perceived as weak. Right? Drop into a prison today or a gang setting or some of the more popular hip-hop artists. Nobody's walking around saying, excuse me, I think you're better than I am. You know, hey, listen, humility is weakness. See the call to contrast the culture. Be strong enough to be humble. Be Christ-like and be humble. You will not find holy harmony without Christ-like humility. The verse continues. Let's now go to the second on the list. You and I, finally, all of you, have unity of mind, have Christ's humility, and then here, have his sympathy, have Christ-like sympathy. This word in the Greek, it means to literally climb into the feelings and the emotions of another. It's to feel the heart of another person when they're hurting. Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one another's burdens. In so doing, you're fulfilling the law of Christ. This is to so care about another. And I've been blessed as a Bridge family member and pastor. I've watched some of you cry others' tears. I've seen it. You want to know holy harmony. Have a sympathy that the world doesn't know what to do with. Climb into the emotions of another, celebrate their celebrations. Grieve their grief. Do like Christ. These are all ways into this holy harmony. Remember, it was Jesus, we're told in John eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse in all the Bible. Jesus wept. Why? Because he was sympathizing with those in pain. 
He knew in a few minutes, I'm going to give the party of parties. These folks that are in tears are going to be celebrating like they've never done before. I'm bringing Lazarus out of the tomb. They're going to see the dead man walking. But right now I weep with them because they're engrossed in sorrow and I feel it. You want to find holy harmony, sympathize like Christ. Let me show you the verse continues and we'll jump now to the fourth point instead of the third. Have a tender heart, care like Christ. You want to have holy harmony, care like Christ. Care to the point where it's irrational. What do you mean you care that much? You're that tender hearted. Say, you, you don't understand. If somebody were to walk in today and just come up to me and slam my left arm with a hammer, let me tell you, my whole body's hurting. You say, what do you mean your whole body? He only hit your arm. Yeah, you can't hit my arm without affecting all of me. You want to be so tender hearted. In the original language, this word is strange. It actually means good bowels. In the Greek, it means to have good bowels. Say, what? The teaching is that you feel it in your gut. You so care that it's down in your gut. You want to have holy harmony. You don't just sympathize, you care. Oh yeah, boy, that's really sad. I, I have sympathy for you, that's really sad. No, 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 no. You have sympathy and a caring that's down to the gut level. You know, I feel nauseous because I see what they're going through. I don't care what it takes. I'm telling you from my gut, I'm all in. We're going to help. This is the path to finding harmony. Let me show you the finish line. Love like Christ. Right in that gap, what are you going to see next? Watch this. Love like Christ. Have brotherly love. Some of you have noticed the colors. Some of you have noticed the position. But don't jump over the adjective. Love is the noun. Brotherly is the adjective. It's not just love. It's not hippie love. It's not religious love. It's brotherly love. Well, how do you define brotherly? Well, that means you're part of the family. Okay, which family? All of you that have been caused to be born again. All of you that are in God's family. And how do you get adopted? Back to the center, Christ and his cross. Back to the gospel. If it's gonna be brotherly love, it's true Christian love. And the only way you get there is through Christ. You get right with him, and now you can be righteous with everybody else. And this is where you're gonna find that biblical, holy harmony. If you go through 1 Peter, what you'll find is from before, here, and after. It's a major theme throughout. It's a theme and a core component of the gospel. It's to be those that are now adopted into the family of God. That's the gospel. And Jesus himself tells us in John 13, 34 and 35, he says, listen, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And in so doing, with this brotherly love, the world will know that you are mine. The witness of your love for one another, the holy harmony of your lives not, oh, holy harmony, I could, I could give you that in Greek and Hebrew. I shared some Greek and Hebrew with you today. It's not whether or not you know it in word, it's whether or not you're living it in worship, if this is who we are. I was talking with Moses this morning. We've had a tragic example in Uganda of somebody who has said, hey, listen, I, I, I gotta get the certificate and I'm gonna get to wear one of those funny collars and everybody will know that I'm a Christian because I'll have the funny collar. I said to Moses, you let him know that if you need a collar, somebody needs to look at your neck to know that you're a Christian, you got a bigger problem than your wardrobe. It's our witness. This is why we were given the Holy Spirit, Acts 1.8. 
It's our walk by your love for one another. It's the focus of Christ's prayer in John 17 that we would have a perfect unity, a Trinitarian level of love and oneness together. That this is the essence of living a life worthy of our calling, living a life that is bringing glory to God through our harmony with one another. There are some, no doubt, who will bristle and challenge. Let me just show you the chiastic arch that is this verse. This is what God's word says. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, which means you have to have a humility of mind. So sympathize with one another that your compassion is guttural. And you wanna put all that together? Let me just say it to you this way. Have brotherly love. That's the point. All of the harmony comes down to right here. Be the church, church. Be the church all the time, every day, all day. Well, you know, we're gonna get along except for, no, get rid of that except for. Stop writing checks on God's account that you can't cash. He doesn't say, oh, well, you've got this personal asterisk. Well, you know, it's a little different for so-and-so. Hey, listen, I understand with you. It's rubbish. It's all from the pit of hell. It's all dividing away from the unity of Christ, Christianity, and the call to be the church. How do you pull this all together? Three points, really. Here they are. You harmonize Christ-like heads Christ-like hearts and Christ-like hands. Did you see it in the colors? The Christ-like heads have unity of mind, have humility of mind, harmonize Christ-like heads, harmonize Christ-like hearts, sympathize, feel their pain, celebrate their celebrations, and care, care beyond what seems rational. Down in your gut, care. That's harmonizing Christ-like hearts. You say, Pastor Jeff, it said at the end to have brotherly love. What are you doing putting that in the hands? Isn't that the heart? No, this is the real deal. This is when you live it out. This is the call to 1 John 3, 18. Let us not love with word and tongue, but in action and in truth. That's the hands of a harmonized family, really loving one another. It's on the manifesto. I put it twice. People ask me, why you put the parentheses there? Because it needs to be said twice. We are truly loving one another. Truly loving one another. Because this is the part that's easy to rationalize and write off. Well, I'm just gonna go to this other church. You know, oh, I'm just gonna do it this way. Well, you know, it's not a tier one issue. All the rationalization of separation that destroys harmony. And when harmony is destroyed, the witness is tainted. And the witness is the glory of God on display or being tainted because somebody's got to be in their bonnet or somebody wants a bigger stage or somebody's got justified reasons for none of which will hold up in front of the king on judgment day. He said, what part of this didn't you understand? You were in desperate need of salvation. You were a sinner with no hope. I saved you. I paid the price for you. And what I called for in return was you be my family. You be my holy, harmonized family. To the extent that he and we overtake the me, there will be holy harmony. It comes down to this. Let me just show it to you. Finally, all of you, be Christ's harmonizing truth and love. Not just truth and love, his harmonizing truth and love ambassadors. You want to shrink it down even further? Finally, all of you, Be Christ's church. Start at God's finish line. All of you 
submit. Think like Christ, sympathize like Christ, love like Christ, care like Christ, and again, submit like Christ. This whole section of 1 Peter comes under the umbrella of submission. Submission. And you're gonna need that because we're gonna see the next step is we're about to get into the hurting. It's gonna get hard. And only those submitted, blessed and beloved, harmonized family members of God are gonna come through that hurting in a God-honoring and blessed way. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that on this day that there is a deeper, more God-honoring understanding of what it is to be your church. I thank you, Lord, for our understanding of the need of your gospel, not just in a personal, not just in a global sense, but in a very practical sense, that we need to be harmonized in our surrendering to the gospel over sin and transgression with one another. Lord, may there be a thinking, a prioritizing in all ways with your mind, a humility, teachable, submissive. May we sympathize and care with your heart's compassion as we love one another, truly love one another. Lord, may our loving up, in, and out be used by you to change the world. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. Lord, I think of those who right now, this sermon is piercing their heart. May they hear the three closing songs that tell them, confess, come running, and then celebrate what it is to be the church. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. Amen and amen.